If you're new, welcome to Beauty Unlocked, the podcast. I hope that you buckled up and you're enjoying this bumpy ass ride, where at any moment you can be thrown off. Here we go. I'm going to be real and raw because that's how I, I keep it here on Beauty Unlocked with you guys. You know that. It starts when children are young. The moment a child is born, relatives start comparing siblings' skin color. We're going to be talking about skin bleaching slash skin lightening. Something appropriate for us as a message. Um, then the only song I can really kind of think of. Good morning, my sugar babies. How's everyone doing? Welcome to a brand new episode of Beauty Unlocked. I'm Carissa. How's it going? Hey, hey. It's an extremely bright, sunny, and slowly, slowly getting hot kind of morning. Thursday morning, I might add, because I record now on a Thursday. Before it used to be on a Monday, and now it's on a Thursday. But that's not the point. Hello, how's it going on your end? I want to know. Is it sunny where you are? Is it cold? Is it rainy? Is it snowing? Because I've heard that in some places it's still snowing. I want to know, how's everyone holding up? I'm going to be real and raw because that's how I I keep it here on Beauty Unlocked with you guys. You know that. I'm pretty direct. (laughs) Sometimes a little bit too direct. But hey, that's that's me. Um, But... I don't know about you guys, but seriously, with uh, now a lot of planets going into retrograde, I feel like my ass is going to be taken for a ride and I can't even buckle up. It's like I told my soul sister here in Cyprus, well, one of them at least, um, you know who you are if you listen to this. I don't know if you want to be mentioned on the show. Your name starts with a J. Hey, hey, girl, hey. Um, But seriously, I told her like my buckle is broken and I am just holding on for dear fucking life at this point. This whole year, we're already in the fifth month of the year. This year is flying by. Most of it was under lockdown and seems like that might be continuing to a certain extent, Um, even though some, let's say, things have been lifted. Slowly, slowly, people are going back to work. There's more traffic, Um, you know, here in Cyprus. Um, I don't know how it is on your end. I want to know, though, Um, but still have to send the government that, that message and they always respond, of course, with that automated response of, um, how does it go? For a reasonable amount of time. Now, I don't know what the hell that means because reasonable amount of time for me could be like five hours, but to someone else, it might be 30 minutes. So, you know, it's kind of a bit like, huh? Um, but that's that. Uh, I feel like my energy is all over the place. I actually did a mic test before just to check that number one, I was using the right mic and number two that it was actually switched on because it's happened where i've been all sorts of confuculated and haven't even switched on the mic and there i'm doing a mic test and i'm like why the hell can't i hear anything oh right because it's the computer's like you know mics that i'm using i see but um yeah no seriously i feel like my energy is all over the place and when i did this mic check this morning i was just like let's get this mess of a show on the road i'm not to be fucked with today Oh, man. No, seriously, I am telling you. Wow. I'm, I, I feel already bad for the technological devices I will be using because they're going to feel the full rage of me today. I'm telling you. Oh, it's only Thursday. I just listened to myself to check if everything was okay. And apparently I mentioned that my energy is all over the place like three times. Well, this is the fourth time. So you can only imagine what's going to be happening in this episode. <laughs> But we're going to get into it because this might be, I mean, you think that me talking the past like three, four minutes is like long, but this episode might be a bit longer. I'm not too sure. We're going to see might be longer than the other ones because there is so much to cover. Um, We're going to be talking about skin bleaching slash skin lightening, the methods of uh, and why it's a global phenomenon. And in order to do that, we're going to basically go back into history and then go into kind of the, not directly the countries affected by this phenomenon, but we're going to talk about certain countries. I'll mention certain countries. Um, I found actually the first time I read about this was I think back in 2002, so a very long time ago, 18 or yeah, 18 years ago 
was it 2002? It was between 2002 and 2004. I'm not too sure. So 16 to 18 years ago. Um, but I remember reading a Time Magazine article about it. And it was, um, it was focusing on the African continent in particular um, when it used, when, you know, um, a lot of people, not that you might know, you might not know, but that it was saying that a lot of people use um, skin lightening products or s skin bleaching products, and sometimes um, they're not regulated, <clears throat> and there, there can be dire consequences. So the way it's going to be broken up throughout the podcast is that we're going to take a look at what it is, skin bleaching slash skin lightening. Um, some common methods, some of the ingredients, and I'll also mention some risks um, involved when using, well, in using such like certain ingredients. But, um, and then we're going to talk about a little bit the history of. So buckle up because it's going to be a long one. And um, towards the end, I'll probably, as always, go into my rant and rave because that's what we do here on Beauty Unlocked. All right, here we go. So before <laughs> before I start again, um, some of there were so many articles. I mean, I, I was just like I was drowning in articles, online articles. Um, but I found and I've taken from here and there. But I've I found articles in Vo uh, in Vogue dot com, BBC, uh, New York Times, The Guardian, CTV News. WelcomeCollection.org. I mean, Echo Warrior Princess. There was just and and some scholastic, uh, well, scholastic, scholarly, I should say, um, articles as well. I'm not going to be able to. I obviously like took bits and pieces here and there and whatnot. A lot of the information like was a regurgitation of like other articles, and I was like, right, okay, so I can skip, 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 skip this, but I still reference them here and there. So a lot of the stuff I'll be posting on social media because, oh my God, like, see, and some of the articles are very long, um, but they were really, really interesting, obviously, because it's, again, it's, it's a topic that obviously I, I actually wrote down a while back when I wrote down like topic ideas and I definitely wanted to cover this and we're covering it on the 13th episode. Ooh, lucky 13. I love it. All right, so we're going to take a look at what exactly skin bleaching is. So explained by a Dr. Claire Chang, who's a board certified dermatologist at Union Square Laser Dermatology, who sometimes like mentioning not only the names, but where they're working, what, I mean, okay. Uh, skin bleaching is the process by which substances are used to reduce melanin concentration in the skin to lighten it. It's an ancient process, and we've discussed this in episodes five and six, and continues to be a thriving business, coming in the form of soaps, creams, pills, and injectables. So, looking into creams, skin lightening creams often aim to interrupt, as we said, the production of melanin or just improve the general health of the skin. They can contain a natural ingredient such as soy, licorice, or arbutin, sometimes combined with medical lightening agent um, hydroquinone though not all creams contain this because it's potentially a carcinogenic ingredient and products containing it are banned and restricted in Ghana, South Africa, Côte d'Ivoire, Japan, Australia, and the EU. Um, but they're still used illegally. <clears throat> Vitamin B3 is another common ingredient, but another previously found in lightning creams and soaps is mercury. So the WHO, <laughs> uh, the WHO, so the WHO uh, has warned, mercury suppresses the production of melanin, but it can also damage the kidneys and brain if it is absorbed by the skin and accumulates in the body. Now, remember, the largest organ that we do have on, on our body is our skin. So other lightening methods include a chemical peel, which removes the top layer of your skin. And this leaves a fresher, uh, the fresher skin exposed to harmers, harmful ooh, solar radiation and environmental pollutants. Laser treatments offer an even more aggressive approach by breaking up uh, skin's pigmentation, sometimes with skin damaging results. So this is actually scary, but a more direct form of treatment is glutathione injections, so injectables. These are commonly used to counteract the side effects of chemotherapy, such as nausea, hair loss, or difficulty breathing. But their growing popularity for skin lightening has led to official concern. Now, talking about glutathione um, injections, in 2011, ah! 
The Philippines Food and Drug Administration issued a public warning about an alarming increase in the unapproved use of um, glutathione administered intravenously, reporting an adverse uh, on adverse effects which include skin rashes, thyroid and kidney dysfunction, and even potentially fatal Stevens-Johnson syndrome, in which the skin peels from the body as if burned. Oh my God, that sounds horrific. Wow. In 2015, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, warned, warned of the potentially significant safety risk to consumers. You're essentially injecting an unknown substance into your body. You don't know what it contains or how it was made. I could say that about a lot of vaccines, but anyway. Nevertheless, there is growing consumer demand. So as per a recent and recent, well, yes, in the last, uh, let's say, 10 years, but Per a recent WHO report, half of the population in Korea, Malaysia, and the Philippines use some kind of skin lightening treatment. And it's even higher in India with 60% of the population using it. In African countries such as Nigeria, they have a ve- the highest percentage actually worldwide. 77% um, use some kind of skin lightening um, treatment. It's also more common in the U.S. than many realize, with bleaching agents such as hydroquinone commonly used in products that treat discoloration and hyperpigmentation. So I found varying um, reports on this, but um, sources predicted that the industry's worth... um, Some said that by 2024, the skin whitening industry will be worth $31.2 billion dollars. There are other sources that predicted by the year 2027, the industry will be uh, worth over $24 billion. So I'm a little bit kind of confused because it's like a it's like a $5.8 billion difference. <laughs> I'm just, just, either way, we're in the billions. We're not even in the millions. So whether it, let's just say it's between 24 and 31 or yeah, $31 billion worth of an industry. Um, which is crazy to, when you think about it. So why is skin bleaching, uh, bleaching sorry, a global phenomenon? Well, the thing is, in order to us understand the current situa- situation, um, we have to go back in history. This is why I say history is important for many things, not only in the beauty industry, but for so many other issues. So I found a very interesting um, topic or a topic, a very interesting, sorry, a very interesting article by um, Gunan, sorry, again, about not pronouncing names properly, um, but I found an article written by Gunan Adamu, and she's a radio presenter and producer for BBC Radio Maryside, CEO and founder of iWoman Academy slash media, and she's also an international multimedia trainer for the BBC. So <clears throat> she says in her uh, in her article that skin lightening procedures work by reducing the concentration or production of melanin. So as we said, melanin is the pigment that gives skin its color and helps it protect us from the sun. Uh, so this is the NHS's description of what skin bleaching is. And it doesn't sound bad. However, it doesn't include any cultural context. Skin bleaching has become a widespread global phenomenon and in the UK is mainly used by people from the African, Caribbean, and Asian communities. Please keep that in mind. So, this is my take on things. I wonder why it's mainly these communities that look to skin bleaching slash lightning treatments. I'm asking, well, could it be that when Europeans went to forcibly take other people's countries and systematically wipe out and enslave? said people that these colonizers brought with them their Eurocentric beauty ideologies and not to mention their religious ideologies that they forced upon these cultures that have been around for thousands of years. Could it be that these Eurocentric beauty ideologies still exist today? The fuck they do. Of course they do. This is the whole reason for Beauty Unlocked. And that they still continue to plague us hundreds if not thousands of years later. Yes. So the writer, that was my bit, by the way. The writer did not say that. I said it. (laughs) I'm such a, whoo, this is probably why I don't write articles, like professional articles, because I would, mm mm-mm. So the the writer continues and says, my fascination with skin bleaching came from my childhood. 
I was born in Nigeria to a fair-skinned mother and dark-skinned father, where comments such as she would be more beautiful if she had taken her mother's complexion or she's getting darker with age were normal. Growing up in the UK as an adolescent didn't help either. I regularly heard comments from boys that they wouldn't they would only date light-skinned girls. Hmm. Defiantly, I wanted to remain darker, but I saw how these comments affected the confidence of many women in the black communi community, both in the UK and abroad. She, she then goes into um, talking about Nigeria. So in Nigeria, being fair gave you access to hot bachelors and a lifestyle that only light-skinned women could enjoy. So many women bleached their skin, damaging it irreparably. The cheap illegal products that they used gave them sore, oh, pinkish complexion rather than the, the desirable caramel color that most of them yearned for. We're going to go into like the light skin and social standing context. So the writer says, today we um, are perhaps most familiar with the porcelain white complexions of wealthy Europeans from the 16th century onwards. Now, this is my bit. If you remember episodes five and six, we discussed the deathly pale look. Five and six. And it was uh, in vogue, even from the time of the ancient Romans and Greeks and Egyptians. If you're new here, welcome. And check out episodes five and six. So the most sought after preparation for this purpose was at the time Venetian ceruse, which we did mention. Um, and as, oh, I'm not too sure if you guys remember, but it contained lead. So this extremely toxic mixture caused swelling, skin discoloration, erosion of tooth enamel, and hair loss. As I always say, what we don't do in the name of beauty. So for a while, it even became fashionable to pluck the hairline to create an extremely high forehead, mimicking the effects of ceruz. Death from using lead-based skin preparations was not uncommon. Mm. Or should I say, dying to be beautiful. Hint, hint. Episodes 5 and 6. Prefer uh, Professor Shirley Ann Tate, a cultural sociologist at Leeds Beckett University, uh, told the author that the practice can be traced as far back as the ancient Egyptians, Romans, and Greeks who discovered that honey mixed with olive oil was a skin lightening agent. Fair enough. At least it's not, you know, going to cause your death. Um, and they applied this mixture to their body and face. All right. That's, that's okay. You know, they also used, this is where it gets to be problematic. They also used various precursors to foundation in order to look paler, including chalk dust and a mixture that, as in later centuries, incorporated white lead. Mm -hmm. Pale skin became desirable because for hundreds of years it was associated with wealth and status. After all, only rich women could afford not to work outside, thereby, thereby avoiding skin darkening effects of the sun. So how did... Europeans export the pale ideal. Well, <laughs> this is where this is where it gets interesting. So the writer says the importance of being pale could be dangerous and addictive. So how did this phenomenon develop in Africa? The simple answer is colonization and slavery. An American sociological society paper explains that to justify racial slavery, slaveholding interests exposed a white a supremacist ideology which held that persons of African descent were in innately inferior to whites. Whiteness became identified with all that is civilized, virtuous, and beautiful. The fuck? Anyway. <clears throat> mm -hmm. If you had lighter skin, you were closer to the opportunities that were only afforded to white people. In this context, light-skinned slaves were separated from dark-skinned slaves and were able to work indoors away from the glaring sun. If you had lighter skin, you were closer to the opportunities that were only afforded to white people, such as increased privileges, higher social standing, and better employment and marital prospects. So if your skin was the only barrier stopping you from having access to better opportunities, the obvious question is, why not bleach? Skin bleaching represents one step closer to the social status historically reserved for white people. However, although we talk about skin bleaching being a global phenomenon, according to Professor Tate, the majority of people from African and Caribbean backgrounds have a negative opinion of it, socially, politically, and culturally. This is due to its connection to white supremacy and colonialism and is linked to the negative connotations being black has had for many years. So this is why many people opt to bleach in secret. So for many, black skin needs to be protected and prized in its natural state. 
So to admit to skin bleaching would suggest that you were trying to conform to the, uh, air quotes, white ideal. In the current climate of being woke, I love that, being woke, and loving the skin you are in, many are bleaching privately and not wanting others to know they bleach. But, the writer continues to say, bleaching your skin should not always be seen in a negative light, as people would admit to using skin lightening products to treat hyperpigmentation, uh, vitiligo, and other skin disorders. The truth is, skin bleaching methods do not get rid of the melanin permanently. This is because the skin is constantly being renewed, which includes the formation of new melanin by melanin-producing um, cells known as melanocytes. So users can stop at any time if and when they choose to. But the question is, what is the lasting effect of skin bleaching, both physically and psychologically? We go into the harmful advertising and product bans. So why is it that so many of us in the black community still have Eurocentric beauty ideologies? The ideology of white beauty and white privilege has been embedded so deep into our history that there is no question that it has seeped into the upbringing of young black people today colonialism has taught us that being light-skinned or white can afford you a level of privilege in a global society should i read that again colonialism has taught us that being light-skinned or white can afford you a level of privilege in a global society mm -hmm. uh, so this is especially apparent in billboard advertising in um, african countries and television ads in india one of these show, uh, one of these uh, advertisements, sorry, shows a poor, dark-skinned Indian girl who lightens her skin and gets the job, the man, and the family she's always wanted. At the end of the advert, she's seen driving into the sunset in a drop-top convertible car, very persuasively presenting the privileges of fair skin. There is still a long way to go. Yes, there is. I'm going to talk about that at the end. But in January 2019, Rwanda became the third African nation to join South Africa and Ghana in a ban on skin bleaching products and advertisements for them. However, banning these products will not stop women from bleaching their skin. The only alternative is to create more awareness around the long-term negative effects of bleaching as well as educating people about the effects of colorism within the African and Car Caribbean communities. Uh -oh. I'm going to be talking about that a bit later. So I actually, while I was researching for this article, I found a very interesting um, paper called Eurocentric Beauty Ideals for Females. And it was written in March, uh, sorry, on March 24th, 2000, 2017. And I'll be posting, it's one of the many articles that I'll be posting on our Facebook group and page. So now we're going to go into India and how it's affecting people and the origins of. So millions of people across the world want to make their skin lighter, but the treatments they uh, use can be dangerous, as we, we talked about previously. So this article was written in 2017, on September 10th. It says that it starts when children are young. The moment a child is born, relatives start comparing sibling, siblings' skin color. It starts in your own family but people don't want to talk about it openly. Also, in, in one of the articles, I found that a 2012 study by a woman's health charity in India found that childless couples often insisted on and paid more for surrogates who were beautiful and fair, though the woman contributed no genetic material to the baby. Wow. So we're going to talk about a woman. Her name is Kavith. Kavitha Emanuel, and she's the founder of Work, uh, sorry, of Women of Worth, an Indian NGO that is standing up to an ingrained bias towards lighter skin. The Dark is Beautiful campaign launched in 2009, and she says it's not an anti-white movement. It's about inclusivity, beauty beyond color. It carries celebrity endorsements, um, most notably the, uh, the Bollywood actor Nandita Das. Uh, there's a blog that provides a forum for people to share their personal stories of skin color bias. And the campaign runs media literacy workshops and advocacy programs in schools to convey messages of self-esteem and self-worth to young children. That's, that is very good. This is to counteract what Emmanuel says she has seen even in school textbooks 
where a picture of a fair-skinned girl is labeled beautiful and a dark one ugly. Oh, man. Uh, the perfect life from perfect skin, a life that's only bestowed upon those of the right shade. That's the message, the attitude, the mindset that's being passed down. It spawned a multi-billion dollar industry encompassing not just cosmetic creams, but invasive procedures, which we mentioned, such as skin bleaching, chemical peels, laser treatments, and steroid cocktails and injectables and the pills, uh, whitening pills. And all with very varying effectiveness and health risks. It's more than a bias. It's a cultural obsession and one that's becoming dangerous. Multinational cosmetic brands have found a lucrative market. The driving force, they say, is the still rampant darker stick. Oh, ooh, sorry. So many S's in this. The still rampant darker skin stigma and rigid cultural perception. <laughs> That correlates lighter skin tone with beauty and personal success. That was a tongue twister for me. Oh, wow. That was a tongue twister. So Sunil Bat Batia, um, a professor of human development at Connecticut College, says that this is not bias. This is racism. And she recently wrote um, in U.S. News and World Report about deep-rooted internalized racism and social hierarchies based on skin color. Uh, so we know that in India, they have a very rigid and codified caste system. And uh, I'm sure I, like all of you know about it, but it's the ancient Hindu classification in which birth determined occupation and social stratum. So at the top, you have the uh, Brahmins, which were priests and intellectuals. At the bottom, you have outcasts who are confined to, well, who are, not were, who are confined to the least desired jobs, such as latrine cleaners. Batia says caste, says caste may have been to do with more than occupation. The darker you looked, the lower your place in the social hierarchy. And this system has been um, around for over 3,000 years. So this uh, preference for fair skin was perpetuated and strongly reinforced by colonialism. So not only do you have the caste system that already Di dictates the way of life but also you have it when colonizers came and colonized <sighs> anyway um but uh, sorry so not just uh, in india but in dozens of countries where european power established its dominance go fuck yourselves with your fucking dominance sorry it's the idea that the ruler is fair-skinned, says Emmanuel. All around the world, it was a fact that the rich could stay indoors versus the poor who worked outside and were dark-skinned. So already in India, we have the, the caste system, and then we have the colonial powers, powers that came in. So then it says that the final wave of in influence is modern-day globalization. Very true. There is an interesting whiteness traveling from the U.S., to malls in other countries featuring white models. And this is what Batia tells the author of this, um, of the writer of this article. You can trace a line from colonialism, post-colonialism, and globalization. Uh, Western beauty ideals, including fair skin, predominate worldwide. And with these ideals come products to service them. Very true. Of course, the preference for, for uh, ooh, fair skin is reinforced in movies, television programs, and advertising. So the Advertising Standards, Advertising Standards Council of India has attempted to address skin-based discrimination in 2014 by banning ads depicting people with darker skin as inferior, but the products are still marketed. Ads for skin lightening cream still appear in newspapers, on TV, and um, on billboards featuring Bollywood celebrities. So argu arguably, nowhere is the fair skin preference as ingrained as in classified ads placed in newspapers seeking a marriage partner. So it's even in there. Along with requirements for the pr prospective bride's or groom's caste, religion, profession, and education, physical characteristics are listed too. Someone described as dusky, okay, may be skipped in favor of one who is of a fair complexion. That's frightening. Uh, Kavita Emanuel believes that people are more aware of the issue than ever before and hopes that the next generation will see things differently, not just in India, but across the world. In 2016, three students at the University of Texas, Austin, started an Instagram campaign called Unfair and Lovely. 
a play on India's most popular fairness cream, Fair and Lovely. The hashtag Unfair and Lovely uh, invited darker skinned people to share their photos. And in 2013, a young woman in Pakistan, Fatima Lodhi, launched the country's first anti-colorism movement called Dark is Divine. Lodi has written about the prejudice she faced as a child, and she says, I never got a chance to become a fairy in my school plays because fairies are supposed to be fair-skinned. Now she leads sessions at schools to make students more aware about skin color discrimination. Attitudes are already starting to, to shift, some say, especially among girls who are, getting, or are gaining confidence with education, employment, and financial independence outside the home. So, as I mentioned, I found so many articles um, relating to the topic of skin whitening, skin bleaching. And I found another one by Echo Warrior Princess. And in her article, she discusses why in South Asia and Southeast Asia, there is a tendency to turn to skin whitening and skin bleaching products. And it's similar to um, what happened in uh, Africa as well as India. And that's because of colonization by Europeans. And she continues to say that it's uh, something because of this colonization, there's an understanding of white supremacy and it's deeply etched into uh, people's minds and it's passed down from generation to generation. And this is why it manifests itself in such a way that in Asia um, or Asians in general are obsessed with skin whitening products. So the origin of the belief that white is synonymous with power and that white equals beauty began not with mo the modern day beauty industry, but at the time of colonization in many Asian countries. It, then she breaks it down, um, China, Japan, and South Korea. Now what she says is that in China, way before the first dynasty, dynasty of imperial China, the color of their skin determines social status. So again, even before colonization, though, we kind of also get this feeling of, again, it's your, your color determined your social status. And it was in India, it was similar because of their caste system. So, yes, colonization played a role in it, but there was also in certain societies, such as in Imperial China, that they already had this class, class social classification um, the darker you were, it meant that you worked outside in the sun, and the lighter you were, it meant that you were able to stay indoors and you didn't have to have such manual labor. So here she says also in China, some aristocrats even smoothed on a lead oxide powder on their faces just to create a much bigger difference between them and the working class. But here, she says, having, uh, in China, having white skin and putting makeup on is considered essential to enhance beauty in China. And she says, as high as 30% of, of the income is spent on different skin whitening products and routines. She says, however, most Chinese people still place a lot of value in their health to achieve a fresh and younger look. Exercise, for one, is completed first thing in the morning, followed by a breakfast that is usually made up of anti-aging ingredients such as vegetables that are grown in soil that contains selenium. And some believe eating food as extreme as a sheep's penis provides the collagen they need for plump, youthful skin. Okay. Well, when I lived in China, I didn't know about that. Yes, of course, their, their breakfast did contain um, vegetables and things like this, but I, I didn't know about the sheep's penis that provides collagen. That's good to know, though. All right, sheep's penis. I'll keep that in mind. I mean, it's better than, you know, poisoning oneself with God knows what in these beauty products, right? Sheep penis it is. In Japan, um, she says, skin lightening treatments are offered in many beauty salons in Japan, but their spa theme parks, they have spa theme parks, also offer a variety of whitening activities and products, tools that can mold your face and noses to achieve the ideal, quotes, air quotes, shape, and even an assortment of vitamin E supplements. These supplements are taken while applying skin whitening creams to allow the lightening process to work better and achieve optimal results. Achieving a flawless white skin tone is so important that they even have salons for shaving off all traces of facial hair to ensure that whitening creams work better. Okay. First of all, what like really like interests me is this spa theme parks. Like, wait, what? All right, this is interesting. 
And then she continues to talk about South Korea. But there's a bit of a difference with South Korea, she says. Now, uh, this country is globally known for its obsession with skincare and beauty. And as we know from episode, ooh, which one was it? The penis facial one. Was it episode 10, 11? Was it episode 11? And it wasn't so long ago. I'm telling you, my mind is all over the place. But we know that the penis facial kind of had its origins from South Korea. She says that uh, the obsession with skin whitening often takes a backseat to plastic surgery. After all, South Korea is known to be the plastic surgery capital of the world. I'm telling you, you learn something every day. (laughs) I really had no clue. Uh, Cosmetic surgery is so normal that they even have a reality TV show called Let Me In, where contestants stand before a panel of judges pleading to be chosen for a makeover. And when they say makeover, they're actually talking about plastic surgery. And one participant from the Let Me In reality TV show even stated that it was fine for her to die on the table than live with an ugly face. Oh, wow. Okay, that, wow. All right. Okay. Um, The article continues to say that in this plastic surgery obsessed culture, Korean children and teens learn to be dissatisfied with how they originally look and want to fix the problem. It's so common that some parents even pay for their children to have plastic surgery as a high school graduation present. I've actually heard about this, but not in South Korea, but from more the United States, that instead of having sweet 16 birthday parties, now parents opt to um, let their daughters have any kind of plastic surgery they want. And I'm like, what? But but what happened to, to sweet 16 birthday parties? Like, what the hell? In this world, plastic surgery is seen as a necessity, boosting confidence and increasing self-esteem, which enables people to function better and gives them opportunities to land better careers. So this is what they believe in in South Korea. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, there we see that in South Korea, it's a bit different. So skin whitening products take a backseat and they're more obsessed with plastic surgery there. Okay. All right. I, I don't. Okay. I found a very interesting article on um, CNN.com and it was written by uh, Ola Brown and she's a medical doctor and the founder of Flying Doctors Nigeria, a leading air ambulance service in West Africa. She's a passionate healthcare advocate and she works with governments, businesses and charities to tackle healthcare issues on the continent. She is a TED fellow and a young global leader as well as the author of three books. And she recently published Fixing Healthcare in Nigeria. And this article was written last year, January the 15th, uh, 2019. Uh, And she was saying that um, although safer alternatives exist, many of the bleaching and lightning products used in Africa contain harmful ingredients such as mercury and high dose steroids. Um, These ingredients can cause, as we've mentioned in previous um, episodes and in this one too, that this can cause kidney failure and other illnesses, making skin bleaching a public health problem that governments need to address. Now, as we said, the WHO did mention that 77% of women in Nigeria use some sort of skin lightening products. And they, like I said, and we said before, me, myself, and I said before, that that's the world's highest percentage but she takes it from a different standpoint as well. She says, however, many healthcare problems in Nigeria and across Africa are not just clinical, they are economical and social. Banning bleaching products will not completely solve the problem of unsafe skin bleaching unless other measures are also put in place. African women don't bleach their skin simply because they are vain. They lighten their skin because fair skin is too often seen as more attractive and provides them with an economic advantage. She she also mentions Matthew Knowles, who's the father of Beyonce Knowles Carter, and he addressed this issue in a radio interview the previous year, so in 2018. And he says that he believed that his daughter is more accepted in the entertainment industry because of her light skin. He also, well, it's also mentioned in his book that uh, he wrote that even his mother disapproved of him having dark-skinned girlfriends. Okay. Okay. So Edward Ademolu, 
a PhD researcher at the UK's University of Manchester, um, defines colorism, which we mentioned before, as an intra-racial complexion-based hierarchy that often affords societal, cultural, economic privileges and favoritism towards lighter-skinned people and discrimination against those with darker complexions. So this is uh, how colorism is defined. Uh, this is evident in many parts of Africa where light-skinned women are considered more beautiful and therefore more likely to succeed in some fields, such as in the modeling and movie industries. Even in the corporate world, many Nigerians would agree uh, anecdotally that women with lighter skin are often more successful in securing jobs, particularly in sales and marketing. So there's evidence to support this. And um, they've done a, a, psych like a psychology research about it, and it's known as the halo effect. I was, I've never heard of the halo effect. But we tend to assume, so this is what the halo effect is. We tend to assume someone has other positive quali qualities because they possess one. Hence, the better someone looks, the better a person we think they are. Also, um, the article continues to say that Shingi Ntero, a lecturer at Rhodes University in South Africa who teaches a course on the politics of skin bleaching, argues in an interview that in post-colonial Africa, there is still a premium, uh, premium on light skin. Whiteness is something that many Africans aspire to, and light skin uh, still has social capital. However, the better job opportunities and elevated status that light, lighter skin may bring paint a different picture, a picture of African women making an entirely rational, calculated, business-like decision. And Ola Brown continues to say that this is the reason I believe banning these products will not completely solve the problem. We must open up a conversation around skin color and beauty and the media, particularly the fashion media, which must feature other types of beauty beyond the Western ideal to end this color bias. I am all up for it. It is a major part of tackling what has become a significant public health problem. Without sustained work to change this perception, we will only be treating the symptoms, but never actually curing the disease. So, this is where I'm going to go on into my little rant and rave, as I do. Well, not on every episode, but I've done it on quite a few episodes, because, you know, I just, I just have to put my two cents into something, right? Um, <laughs> but this is going to be my opinion, so we're going to put everything that we've talked about so far all 13 episodes and we're going to put everything in this big ass box right so from episode one to this uh, lucky number 13 if you're new welcome to beauty unlock the podcast i hope that you buckled up and you're enjoying this bumpy ass ride where at any moment you can be thrown off here we go this is a problem and not the fact that you're going to be thrown off i mean yeah that is a problem but it's not the the, the problem that i'm going to be mentioning this is a problem. It's obvious that society as a whole is riddled with problems. Yes, it is. Welcome. <laughs> it's passed down from generation to generation because like us, they were force fed a certain ideal. In this case, a beauty ideal, ideology, standard of beauty, beauty standard, whatever you want to call it. It's this big pink elephant that's in the room and you cannot stop staring at it. Eurocentric beauty ideals and ideology has been around for a very, very long time. And although there is progress being made and a call for change, it's difficult to erase something that is deeply engraved into any, well, into our society, into any society that has been colonized. And now, of course, with globalization and capitalism, it's just, it's, Eurocentric beauty ideals is, is, is engraved into this society. And I'm not trying to be a negative Nancy, but I'm giving it to you real, raw. I'm pouring my heart and soul out. Heck, my tits are about to fall out from how honest and real I'm being with you guys. I've always kept it real, and I will always keep it real, because that's how it is, right? So whether the origins of any of this and, and talking today about, you know, skin bleaching, skin lightening. So whether the origins stem from thousands of years ago where the color of your skin dictated your social status, and I'm looking at you, China, ancient Rome, Greece, Egypt, and all those um, imperial, let's say, societies at the time, 
or a system that divides a people into a rigid hierarchical group based on karma and dharma, I'm looking at you, India, or from the rise of the Western colonial powers that enslaved and slaughtered millions and forced a standard of beauty that in all honesty is plain it's, it's, it's plain old and ridiculous, and it's stuck like shit under my shoe, to be completely honest with you. I know I rhymed there. I don't even have to listen to it again. I definitely know I rhymed there. There are countless amounts of movements that are paving the way for inclusivity, and we've talked about them in previous epi episodes, whether it be the body positive movement, and under that there comes the saggy boobs movement. There is the... Uh, uh, the movements that we talked about today. So there are a lot of movements that are, you know, paving the way for inclusivity. And there is a younger generation that is fed up, tired, and demanding that there is a change. And we can include ourselves also, if you are a millennial, we are sick and tired of being force-fed these old-fashioned beauty ideals. We're just tired of it. We are literally, but I'm sorry, <clears throat> we are literally trying to bring down and destroy an old fashioned, outdated way of thinking that does not want to loosen its grip on the minds of millions, if not billions of people, because it is so deeply, it, it's just so deeply etched into our, it, it's just there. It's just there. It's, 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 it's difficult to get rid of it. As the saying goes, Rome was not built in a day and the issue uh, especially with today's um, topic. Uh, but the issue of colorism, unfortunately, will not disappear overnight. And it's also, it goes for anything else, whether it be, you know, just anything. But it's not going to disappear overnight. It will take time, patience, working through our, uh, this is also very important, working through our own personal traumas, issues, and problems. Because without doing that kind of inner work because we all have them we've all somehow been judged unfairly based on what we look like whether it be color of your skin your your shape whatever your body type somehow we've we've all been judged somehow in our lifetimes unfortunately and some of the criticism come from those that are closest to us sometimes because don't forget they also live in the society that has these judgments so they have a, a, a way of sometimes regurgitating these judgments onto those closest and could be us you know I know that with my family I've gotten a lot of shit <laughs> over the years about how I dress how I act how I look my white hairs my this my that my body weight I mean you name it I've heard it Seriously, I've seriously heard it. And I know I'm not the only one. And that's why I started Beauty Unlocked because I am sick and tired of these judgments and of this standard, uh, this beauty standard that's just unrealistic. I've mentioned it so many times. So for any of this to actually work, we do have to do the inner work and process our own traumas, issues, and problems, like I said before. And it will take a unified stance on educating and reminding people that all colors body types whatever everything sexuality whatever every one of you and every one of us we are goddamn beautiful and i don't care what people have told you in the past and i know i know how difficult it is to erase those feelings sometimes of I, I don't look good i'm i'm not thin i don't have the flat stomach i don't have the perfect tits i don't have the perfect ass i don't have this you know um i understand it's very difficult and i on a daily basis have to work through the struggles of learning how how would you say forgetting all i've been taught in a way taught in 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 quotes over the years about what and force fed over the years about what is supposed to be perfect and understand that my body is my body and this goes for everyone else. And it's it's difficult to unlearn many, many things, many patterns and everything. But I try every single day. And I'm hoping that you're doing the same work also of accepting yourselves, loving yourselves, and try, trying not to pass judgment. Because when we do pass judgment, it, it, it shows that we have, we, we have unhealed issues within us. If we immediately judge somebody by the way they look, and and just immediately say well this person is not let's say good looking for example why is that per where did that come from 
from whose standard would you be judging this person? Is it your own personal standard of calling someone, let's say, unattractive or fat or no, they're too dark, they're too light, they're too pale, they're too pink? I don't know, whatever color. I don't know. You know, where do these judgments, you know, come from? We got to stop. We got to analyze ourselves. We got to check ourselves sometimes and notice that there are some behavioral patterns within us that need to change before we make a change in this world. That's how I see it. And that's why I always end these episodes, apart from saying follow follow Beauty Unlocked on social media, on Instagram, on Facebook group, Facebook page, send me an email and all this. I always end episodes by saying, love each other, love yourself, spread some of that sweet, sweet love because we all need love. Enough with the hate, enough with the hating, enough with the hating on on others hating ourselves and things like that. Each one of you listening to this and everybody around the world, obviously that does not listen to this, but I'm just saying like everybody is different, unique and beautiful. Thank God we are different because how boring would it be if we were the same goddamn copy, same style, same haircut, same body shape, same color, same... Oh my God, it would just be like, what the fuck? What kind of world is that? No, we should be celebrating and we should be definitely spreading the word on like inclusivity. All shapes, all sizes, all colors, everything is just beautiful. It is, we, we are meant to just be different from each other. You know, let's celebrate those differences, you know, embrace the differences, embrace the uniqueness. On that note, <laughs> <laughs> oh, newcomers, I hope you enjoyed this episode because it was it was a long one for sure. We are up to <clears throat> almost an hour long. Holy crap. But I just had so much to say and I just I want everyone to understand that seriously, the whole purpose of this of this show, of this podcast was to really like look at how, you know beauty standards yes for sure and also how they've affected society's cultures around the world, how they affect us. It's like checking society and just being like hold up no 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 and bringing up these topics where it's just like what the fuck what's happening in this world let's celebrate each other irregardless of anything let's just celebrate each other spread always the love and light and positivity even on those dark deep dark days that we might have where we can't even see beyond the clouds know that there is better days to come and just there's there's inner fires in all of us and just let the burn like let the flames burn and burn brightly spread that love always spread the love always spread the positivity and try to give someone a compliment heck don't forget to compliment yourselves as well on that note you will hear from me next week and with that i hope you guys have a beautiful <clears throat> excuse me beautiful beautiful weekend a beautiful next week as well stay safe don't forget to spread some of that good good old-fashioned loving okay right now it has to be from a distance but spread that love all right you guys take care and you will hear from me next week bye wow